Hi, everyone. I'm Maddie. I'm a senior editor at Anxi. I'm Cade McBride. I'm an associate editor at Anxi. Oh, and we hi. wanted to start just with a deep breath because I don't know if anyone else was feeling really angsty from that music just now, but yeah. I was. So let's all just take a deep breath on three. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, I feel so much better. Um, so the other thing we wanted to start with was a quick poll. How many people here know someone who has struggled with mental health in their lifetimes? Great. And how many people who themselves have struggled with mental health at some point in their lifetimes? So that actually is in line with some of our statistics, too. And how many people struggle to figure out how to talk about their mental health? Nearly half of the adults in the U.S. have struggled with mental health and develop a mental illness in their lifetime. We started Anxi because we were tired of feeling ashamed of our emotions and feeling like we needed to hide these struggles. Instead, we wanted to bring all the crap we were dealing with inside out in the open, and we wanted to have real conversations about what we were dealing with. Am I supposed to do yeah. the slides? Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, that's not the right way. That one? This one? Yeah. Okay. There we go. And not only that, we wanted to make these emotions, these struggles that often are billed as ugly or dirty, we wanted to make them beautiful um, and artful. We wanted to show them as vivid and real like they felt to us. And that's how Anxie was born. So um, we didn't know if anyone would think this was a good idea. Uh, we thought it was, but it was just like six of us and didn't know if anyone else would. So we decided to launch the idea on Kickstarter of making this magazine and we raised over, or we raised almost $60,000. And what is, I, in my opinion, almost more impressive um, is that the number of like direct messages, emails, comments um, from people who maybe couldn't necessarily afford to donate very much to the campaign, but were like, I will help you with your illustration needs, your copy editing needs, like whatever. I just want this thing to exist. Um, was really incredible and gave us a sense that maybe we were on the right track and this was something that would be a good idea to more than just the six of us. So we're really honored when Kickstarter featured it as a project we love. And we ran our first event in San Francisco as a storytelling event with different writers and photographers and journalists for about 150 attendees at the Battery. And um, it was, yeah, it was a really awesome event. Um, what else am I talking about? So we felt like people really wanted a community around this. Like they, when they heard about it, they wanted to either donate money or their time or just let us know that we were on the right track. So now we use Kickstarter also for our pre-orders, which allows us to shave some of the cost, to have some of the printing costs ready to go before we're ready to print. So we found them to be great partners and we've also been really supported by various media outlets. We were mentioned in the New York Times, we were mentioned in HuffPo, and um, all of that brought sort of more enthusiasm and brought this concept to more people and um, kind of just broadened our audience. Yeah, and the momentum is still going um, after three issues. Uh, we never thought we would be here tonight, but we are, and we're really excited to share it with you. Um, we're gonna get to that in a moment. Um, first, we wanted to just talk about how we make every magazine and um, what's inside. So these are the three angsty issues we've put out. We're a biannual publication. Um, each issue takes about five or six months to make. Um, we're a distributed like team. Uh, all over the West Coast and elsewhere in the world as well. Um, so ultimately with Anxie, we want to tear down the stigmas around mental health, around 
um, our emotions. Each issue explores some central theme, um, whether that's like some aspect of our lives, some struggle, some emotion. Um, the first issue was anger. The next issue was about workaholism. And our last issue that we're premiering today is about boundaries. Um, inside, you'll find a mix of uh, big interviews, personal essays, investigative features, um, really beautiful design work, beautiful photography, photos, illustration, art. Um, one thing we wanted to do is make Anxi really rooted in design because we want to bring an artful perspective to something that's usually seen as ugly. This is our first Kickstarter video. Um, it kind of explains our mission and, uh, you know, both stylistically and in terms of content, what we're trying to do with Anxi. Let's look at our inner worlds, the ones we often refuse to share, the secret hopes, the personal struggles. The fears that fool us into believing that the rest of the world is normal. We want to create a publication dedicated to eliminating the stigma around being sad, feeling stuck, or showing our vulnerabilities. A magazine focused on true understanding without judgment. Articles that cut through the clutter to offer real discussions about all the thoughts, feelings, and emotions buzzing in our heads. Let's share our stories, talk about those difficult moments, and explore how they affect our lives. Let's stop pretending we're flawless and have the courage to be our full selves. Anxie Magazine. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Indira Rojas, who uh, is the founder, creative director, mother of all things, Anxi. Um, she's the reason we're all here. So Indira Rojas. I think this is going to work. Is it working? Do you hear me OK? Oh, OK, great. Um, well, um, I'm so glad to be here. I, I actually am happy that Maddie said what she said. Like, we didn't really think we were going to be here. Um, ANC really started as a project where we've been sort of like taking each step every time we kind of hit a milestone. Um, and this is a milestone for us. Like, we've been um, doing the magazine since 2016, and this is our first launch event, even though it's our third issue, um, mainly because this is when we're kind of ready to take that step. So thank you, everyone, for being here. I want to thank Michelle for um, just working with us and suggesting this beautiful event. I'm, I'm so grateful that UCHI's given us this opportunity. So, and thank you for, uh, to Yelp for hosting us as well. Um, so I want to talk to you about a question I get asked a lot. And what I'm hoping to do is to contextualize um, how Anxi came about through my personal story. And hopefully that will feed into the themes that you'll see um, that we'll bring up. Um, so Michelle's going to join us after to talk about our photography approach. And Bobby will close with our editorial approach. So you will get a full picture. This is actually the first time we've done this. You get a full picture of what it's like to produce NC and what our process is. Um, and you know, it all starts with, why did I start <laughs> Um And you know, just like Maddie was sort of saying, um, mental uh, illness um, and mental health challenges are something that a lot of people are struggling with. And it's something that we keep quiet, um, something that we have difficulty talking about. Um, and what it does is creates a situation where we are not sharing our inner worlds. Um, and we're sort of pretending that everything is OK and putting this front in front of people um, and not really you know, be allowing others to see our vulnerability. And what we see as a challenge with this is that you know, if you're feeling sad, if you're struggling, if you're angry, if you're lonely, you might not have um, 
uh, the self-resource to reach out because you're so ashamed or you feel like no one will understand and you feel like it's not something you're supposed to be talking about. So what we want to do with ANSI is really create a platform where those conversations can be had and where it's okay to talk about these things. You know, it doesn't, you don't have to talk about it with everyone. <laughs> um, but, you know, talk about those things with people you trust. Um, and how do we make it okay to not feel ashamed about these things? Um, so, and the thing that I find difficult about us not being able to talk about these difficult challenges is most of the time, a lot of us will emerge from childhood with wounding of some kind. For some of us, it's more severe than others. Um, but the reality is that this is just, you know, a natural and more very normal aspect of what it means to be a human in the world. So if we recognize that that's the case, why don't we allow ourselves to, you know, present that to others? Um, so just to give you a little bit about, you know, my background and where I come from and how um, my trajectory connects to ANSI, it really comes back to where I'm from. Um, and mainly because, you know, as an immigrant who's only been here since 2005, um, there is a lot of, you know, my journey when I lived in the Dominican Republic that has shaped who I am. And then my journey as, you know, now being an American citizen and sort of being in this community that also, you know, influences what I'm doing now. Um, so I don't know if a lot of you know because a lot of people, um, associate the DR with, you know, tropical, you know, very beautiful um, tourist area, but the DR is a very metropolitan um, city. So I consider myself sort of a city girl. Um, and it's very dense, um, but this is sort of, you know, what people think about when I think of the DR. And, you know, the, the main experience that happened for me when I lived in the Dominican Republic is I was, you know, victim and a survivor of child um, abuse. And it happened at a really early age. And, you know, for me, it, it's sort of what does a person do when something like that happens to you that you have no control over? And the even saddest part is, you know, it usually happens with a person who is in your inner circle, might be part of your family, you know. It some, so, usually happens with someone you know. And there is this reality that, you know, a lot of us are struggling with the issues that we didn't really have a choice in. And how do we then, you know, adapt from that? Something that helped me a lot is that I went to this really extreme structure school. You can see it in this uniform. Everyone had to wear the uniform. Um, and I went to the same school since I was in kindergarten. Um, this is a bilingual school, um, so that's why my English is so fluid. Um, and you know what happened in the school is um, they had a lot of, it was founded by an American uh, a person who brought in teachers from the U.S. and one of the teachers created a, a dark room in the in the school, and I started experimenting with photography. Um, and what photography did for me is that it allowed me to start having an inner dialogue about what was I curious about, what are the things that um, I was gravitating towards, um, where are the things that drew my attention, and I think that that is sort of what I consider the original thread of Angsi. Um, in terms of art, using art as a vehicle to process this inner dialogue. And once you've processed it, to then be able to share it. Um, so this is me, ready to go to art school. Um, and this is me at Alto de Chavon. This is Fala Cher here, by the way, uh, and Seymour Schwast. Um, so I, I went to this really cool art school that is like um, two hours away from the city. It's very kind of like you're in your own little bubble. Um, and it allowed me to um, graduate with what it's called an associate degree and then I earned a scholarship to go to Parsons um, and then after Parsons I, I went to a CCA to do my master's in design um, and that has been sort of like the foundation of my creative career um, but one thing that happened once I moved away from home is that all this drama started to emerge and it, it's very natural that that would happen because once you have distance not only distance of time but also distance of place um, you're able to really face this thing that you probably have been protecting yourself towards. Um, so when I was in Parsons as a you know, recent student, I started to realize that I had all these complex feelings I really couldn't control, um, that it were 
sort of hijacking my relationships with friends, with you know, uh, boyfriends, with you know, family members? And how do you then, um, you know, what do you do with that, basically? Um, I was really lucky that, again, I found my way through photography, but I also found my way through um, basically a counseling uh, through Parsons. Parsons does this thing that when um, they consider you an international student who is in a transition period, um, and you're kind of at risk, um, of you know, adapting to a new culture, um, not feeling isolated. So they offer free counseling. And that was really what, what saved me. Um, I was able to find uh, counseling and at the same time explore photography. And in the counseling, you know, by the time I got there, I remember my first session, it was just me bawling. <laughs> like hardcore just crying, screaming at the therapist who had no idea what was going on, and just like, just like unloading on her. Things that I could have never told anyone, basically. Um, and, and I realized how that really started my journey with understanding how, you know, getting the help that you need, but also learning how to have a relationship with your inner self can really start creating some pathways. So even though my degree at Parsons was in communication design, I spent most of my time in the photography department. Um, I didn't really think I could afford to be a photographer um, because equipment's really expensive and all of that. So I ended up just doing a lot of photography on the side. And when I look at my photographs now, um, these photos are now more than 10 years old. Um, what I realized is I was trying to have this inner dialogue with whoever I was observing and trying to figure out you know, how to connect with them, what they were about, um, trying to see a way in which um, I could sort of see their real self and allow us to be in an intimate conversation in which they will sort of really show me what they're, who they're about and what they're about. Um, so after I started sort of exploring photography, I started getting closer. Um, this is a photograph of my mom um, and a photograph of my, my sister. And I ended up doing my thesis on this uh, idea called the self-concept. So through one of my photography classes, we started, I discovered this book um, called Photographing the Self. Um, and what it really talks about is whatever you photograph really talks about what you're photographing as much as it talks about you. And it talks about, you know, what are you, again, what are you gravitating towards, how you interpret the world. And I then started exploring this idea of how could I use photography to understand women better, not only because I wanted to understand myself as a woman, but also wanted to understand how women are represented um, in, in the world and, and also you know, how we're struggling. Because um, I know statistically I'm not the only one, right? Um, so what I find really fascinating about this is, again, I hadn't seen this work in like 10 years. It's sort of archived in you know, my studio. And I, did, I gravitate towards this question um, about um, personal growth. Do you think you dedicate enough time to the things you want to do for your own personal growth? And what I see there is this interest in also like self-exploration. Um, and it's something that I, didn't, was, I wasn't so aware that it has been a thread, um, but it's definitely where I kind of see has influenced a lot of what we're trying to do with ANSI. So here's the photographs I took of um, the people who sat for my thesis, and I asked them to bring an object or anything that they would feel would represent their self-concept. And these were the types of things um, people did in front of the camera. And through them doing that exploration, I got, I got to know them and I got to know myself. Um, so now I want to fast forward a little bit. Um, you know, I graduated from Parsons um, in New York. I met um, my current spouse there. Um, and, you know, through doing a lot of the work that I did and through, um, you know, doing my thesis and all of that, I, I felt like I had dealt with it, you know. Um, so we ended up moving. Uh, to California for me to go to CCA and my relationship with my therapist because of the distance started tempering and I kind of felt like I've done it. <laughs> I've done the work. I've dealt with it. Um, and my career started taking, um, you know, sort of um, expanding where I got to work at the Bowl Italic um, for a few years. I got to work at Salesforce. I got to work at Medium and I started to feel like my life was taking a certain direction. Um, 
But what I didn't expect is that, you know, every now and again, things will start bubbling up. Um, and I think this is because we, you know, it, it, it's like, it's like the, best, the way that someone described it to me the most is like it's like an onion with layers. So you only can go so deep until you're ready to go to the next layer. Um, and what I started to realize, it was even though I felt like I, I understood how you know, my experiences had shaped me, I, it was, there were still behaviors and things that I was doing that were still disrupting um, my life. And you know, one of my biggest takeaways is like most of the time, especially someone who has survived sexual abuse, they, you, know, you walk the world feeling very broken. Um, and you walk the world feeling like you're not. Why would someone do that? Um, are you worth anything, right? And what I started to realize is that it is very natural for someone who experienced what I experienced to behave the way that I behaved. And that there are ways in which your biological system gets engineered the more you experience stress and the more you experience trauma. And this is the part where I get a little bit academic, mainly because these have been some of the tools that has helped me the most in terms of understanding how trauma affects your brain, how it affects your stress response, how it affects how you navigate the world. And many times we have these reactions and we blame ourselves because I'm, I don't know what I'm doing, because um, I'm always so confused about everything because whatever, right? There's negative inner dialogue that gets in the way of us sort of, you know, connecting with ourselves and really finding our voice. So um, I didn't really know there was this thing called the parasympathetic and the sympathetic system. And that when you experience acute stress, it changes the way your body responds to stress. Um, and the more you experience stress, the more easy for you it is that if you're triggered, you would jump into a stress response. And many times you see yourself unraveling and this is what's happening. Your system is out of whack because that's what it learned to do to survive. Um, and when you start reframing your experience as a, it is natural that I would feel this way because my system is different because of what I've experienced. Then it's easier for you to find a way in which you don't have to always feel like you're the broken one. Um, another really interesting concept, I don't know how many of you know about attachment, um, but the other thing that I like to talk to with people is that regardless of the relationship that you had with your caretakers, it creates a blueprint for all your interpersonal relationships anywhere, whether in your family, whether in your work environment, you know, if you're interacting with another human, this map is, you know, coming into effect. So, you know, a lot of us didn't necessarily have this chart here represents a, you know, an attachment um, process in which you know, the child is not getting all their needs met, which, you know, if you have suffered from severe neglect, again, it affects your, bio, your you know, neurological system and affects how you deal with stress. Um, so for me, it has been really about trying to break apart um, what are things that are actually a trauma response. Um, and that's what I started to notice, especially, you know, in the work environment, that something would happen, it would trigger me, I wouldn't know why, but I know I was really upset. Um, and I couldn't even articulate what was happening. And now I found that through going even deeper into psychology and educating myself about how the body works, how the body deals with trauma, how we can use the wisdom of our body to heal ourselves, um, I started to you know, look closer at, in my case, um, there's this term called um, emotional dysregulation, which is a very natural effect um, of growing in an environment where you feel neglected. So, so that, that is what I've identified for myself. A lot of people can identify other things, um, whether it's chronic depression, whether it's addiction, whether it is whatever it is for you or for other people. Um, but I think like for me, it has been about identify what has been those unmet developmental needs and providing those for myself. Um, and I feel that that is really where NC started, trying to figure out one of my needs was to not hide about my story because I spent my whole life hiding about it um, and sort of feel like I can be in the world and people can know this 
and I don't have to feel ashamed about it. So, um, sorry. So, you know, this was the kind of birth of our first issue. I wrote this Medium post about this, about struggle with workaholism, about struggle with lack of um, worthless, uh, feeling unworthy or worthless. Um, and sort of trying to figure out, is there, is there a way in which um, I don't have to feel that I'm the only one, because I know that's not the case. Um, so in terms of the art, you know, through my personal story, I've seen that art is really the way in which for those things that we don't have words, it really provides a space in which you can um, start to understand, even if it's in a felt sense, what's happening for you. And I really do think that um, with art comes empathy, which is what Dave Eggers is saying in this quote. And that's sort of what we're trying to build with Inksy. Not only empathy for other people, but empathy for ourselves in understanding that, you know, in some way or another, um, a, lot of, a lot of us are dealing with our own struggles. And here's where I talk about how the idea of Inksy and art um, kind of like manifests in the magazine. And what we're trying to do is take these personal stories um, and give them a, a voice that you know is engaging not only in the written form but also in the visual form, and make it you know make it interesting that people want to read it. Like one of the things that we find in what's out there in terms of mental health is like it either has like a, a medical angle or an illness angle or in a way that you're like that's definitely not me and I do not want to be associated with that. Um, where here it's like, actually, I want to read about Margaret Atwood and I want to read about what she has to say about anger. And then I want to think about how does anger manifest in my life or in my community or in my environment. Um, I really like this story by Brian Frank. Um, Brian Frank you know, had experience as being incarcerated and then he came out of the system and started shooting the incarceration system and looking at this inside outside and you know, I, I assume how healing it must be for him to be able to see it from the outside and think about his experience and also you know, be an advocate for what's happening um, and how can he talk about his trauma through that process. So we definitely feel like art is the way in which we bring people in. Um, to a subject that they will otherwise probably want to avoid. Um, this is our second issue, the workaholism issue. And here are some stories also that are very inksy like um, For me, like the psychoeducation part is really important. So for the, psycho, uh, the workaholism issue, I really wanted us to talk about what's the difference between working hard and working compulsively? Because there's a lot of people that don't know where that edge is, and they think they're working hard, but actually they're working compulsively. Oh, the other way around. They think they're working compulsively, but actually they're just working hard. So you know, we, we want to use art as a way to bridge these contents and also make it so people can really like take them in. Um, this fresh pain, old wounds. I remember talking to Bobby about this piece and how I really wanted to have a piece like this in the issue, mainly because I myself remember everything that I struggled with triggers at work. And I think that we need to have that conversation that as much as we want to live our personal self at the door when we go to work, these things do come up. So how do you navigate those and what do we need to do in the workplace to make it safer for people to you know, bring that up? Um, you know, and this is another aspect that um, we will talk about more later, but we also try to address a topic from really weird angles. In this case, we just wanted to talk about Vegas. And what's it like from a workaholism point of view when you're in an environment where, you know, work is nonstop. You're expected to be on all the time. And, you know, what can we learn from that? I really love this piece. Uh, this was reported by Katie. Um, and this was another sort of interesting angle at, towards work, workaholism. And what I like about this work that we're doing is we're really bringing in you know, our personal interests and try to like, expand into places that we feel are not being looked at enough. Um, and in this case, um, we talk to teens about 
their classmates who have committed suicide because of pressure um, in their schools and what it's like to have experienced that and how it feels like to be part of that community and what, what do they consider too much pressure. Um, and you know, for us, these are topics that we should be looking at. Um, this one is about Uber um, and Lyft and talking about how we manifest the systems where we're expecting people to work all the time. Um, so what we're trying to do is explore these topics in a way that's broad enough so they are, we're not only talking about mental health, we're talking about other systems and other community aspects and hoping that there's an angle in which it nourishes your sense of mental health. Um, but it doesn't mean that we need to be, as you've seen, we're not trying to prescribe, we're not trying to say your problem is, we're not trying to say, here's how you're happy in five steps, you know, because we, we don't, we don't, that, that doesn't really work. What's going to work is I read a story that I identify with that touches me and it changes the whole trajectory of my whole life. That's what's going to work. Um, so for us, the truly heroic is to put effort to live through pain and to be spontaneously transformed by it. Um, so, you know, how can we allow ourselves to be this vulnerable and to kind of face some of these challenges so that we can, um, you know, enable that growth. I think this is my last section, which I show you our video for boundaries. Um, what I, for me, manifests all of these values that I've been talking about. What lines do we draw? And what space do we create? Who pushes our limits and why? And when do we push back? Let's talk about boundaries, how they shift from person to person, place to place, and moment to moment. How they can be imposed from the outside or come from within. Let's talk about the things behind our boundaries, our inner worlds, our personal stories, the feelings that define who we are and where we draw the line. This is the boundaries issue. Anxie Magazine. So what you've seen is we always start our videos with a lot of questions. Um, because for us, it's really about creating a prompt that creates reflection. Um, and I'm not going to go into the issue because we're going to hear about it from the team. But I just want to walk you through um, a few of, this, of the slides of you know, the stories that we're telling. And I'm really proud of this issue because I feel like we've really gotten to know our process a little more. Um, and I feel like we're you know, taking it to the next level. Um, and, and I really think that we have the opportunity to do something special with ANSI. I want to leave you with this quote because I, when I read this quote, I just, it just kind of, my, my heart kind of blew up. Um, and I think it's because of this, because I feel like we're always, not always, but I feel like we're, we tend to not think about our story and not think about the value that our story has. You know, I think I agree with Michelle Obama, like our story is what we have and it's something to own because it really does inform everything else that happens. So I, I really think that if there's anything you can take away from tonight is, you know, own your story and, and try to see how you can navigate the different challenges. And I hope that NC um, can make that possible. Thank you. Big round of applause for Indy. Thank you. So before I introduce the next uh, speaker, I wanted to just do a quick shout out. Um, we are doing an audience survey right now. Um, there are a few printed out copies in the back on tables and we would love for you to fill it out because we really want to understand you all that are reading and consuming um, what we're making and we want to make it better. And the only way we can do that is if we know who you are, what you're liking, what you're not liking and what you want to see next. Um, so if you can fill it out, that would be awesome. Um, we also have the link to the Google form uh, in, on Twitter or on Facebook.
Thanks. And next up, we have the director of photography for ANCSI, Michelle. Hi, everyone. I'm going to bring it back old school with my notes up here, so stay with me. Um, okay. Um, so uh, first off, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, we really appreciate your support. So every single person in this room has experienced struggle. Our experiences, our traumas, um, it doesn't go away, but we can choose how to carry that weight. Okay. For myself, I'm a product of war. My mom's story of survival, our history, and my own trauma has led me um, to become a storyteller and um, as a photo editor who uh, gives platform for such stories. So uh, like Indy was saying, we hope to create empathy in order to truly connect. So I'm gonna show you a few of my favorite uh, Anxi photo projects and um, talk you through the process. So for our first issue on anger, uh, Melissa Spitz, she's been photographing her mom since she was nine years old. And um, her mom is bipolar with anxiety disorder. So this photo was taken when she was, um, like that's her right there when she was a child. And um, she describes this image as uh, the last time her dad remembers her mother as being normal. So um, when Marissa was seven, her mom was institutionalized and her diagnosis would change frequently. She said living with her was like walking on eggshells. She would often threaten suicide. I thought, I, wait, let me go back. I really liked, sorry, I love this transition from like a mother looking, like she's playing dress up, like she's the child, right? So it's like child, it's like parentification. Um, and then in here, she has a, um, she had surgery and she lifted up her dress for her daughter, like, hey, look at me, take this photo. So I thought that was really powerful. Um, this image is titled uh, Mom's Vacation. So um, I love this image because it really speaks to this project. Like, just the, it's kind of like this glamorous thing. Like her mom really loves being in front of the camera. Um, she loves being the center of attention. But Melissa, um, she's not sure if that's actually a good or bad thing. So she, Melissa was abused a lot as a child through her um, by her mom, and she said that the camera saves her. It serves as a, a protector, and I can relate to this, right? So in the moment of trauma, instead of reacting to it, she lifts up her camera. Her mom kind of sees it, she freezes, does whatever, performs, and then when she's ready, she'll go through the images and she can process what's happening after. So um, her mom was an alcoholic and um, through seeing these images of herself, it actually stopped her from drinking. Um, this is an ongoing project. It's an ongoing dialogue between a daughter and her mother processing their pain and trying to heal, which I think is really rare to see um, in art. We normally see things that like, this happened in my life, I wanna show you here it goes, but she's actually like just continuing to do this from nine years old to now. So um, this is a photo essay by Matt Eich. And um, it's a reflection on the struggles of day-to-day -day life. Having a family, balancing career as a photographer while struggling to provide not just financially uh, for them, but showing up for those really important moments in their life as they're growing older, but often totally missing out. Um, so in this edit, uh, we begin with a, a family portrait where you see everyone's faces. So uh, he is, this is our home in Charlottesville, Virginia. And this is Matt with his wife. Um, they met at a really young age. This is his daughter. 
So what I love about print um, is that it slows you down, right? If you're on a website, you're just clicking through and all that. But what I love about print is that we had an opportunity to show some color in a black and white story. When I, he sent me a bunch of photos, and at first I'm like, what do I do with this? I'm like, do we turn it into black and white? I'm like, no, it loses its power. And when I was thinking about it, like we're processing together and we're talking about it. And so in color theory, the color blue is a calming color. It's soothing. It's supposed to be relaxing. And I love the tension between the tarp with the rope. And he hadn't processed this at the time. So we're just talking about it. And we're like, I'm like, I want this in here. Like it's a very jarring kind of, kind of thing. So um, these are his parents. So after 33 years of marriage, they, um, they actually separated. And it really made him, he's in his 30s now. And he met his wife uh, when they were in college. So they've gone through a lot. You know, in college, you're like bright-eyed, like we're going to like conquer this world. And then as you get older, you're like, oh, shit, I got to pay the bills. I'm a photographer. I'm trying to make this happen. It is tough out there. The industry's changed. Things are different. So his parents separated at a time when, um, you know, he's looking at his own family. Um, so, yeah, he's analyzing himself. So he is feeling guilt, fear, and anger. And it doesn't go away, but how do you cope with it? So um, as the story progresses, we stop seeing faces. Um, these represent the moments that he's missing because he's away for work. And um, I, you know, I play off the caterpillar to the butterfly as a metaphor for the daughter growing older. And then we end with um, her looking out the window in search of her father. The color red is anger, but her stance is soft. Okay, so this is, this is my family now. We're gonna take a, we're gonna take a turn here. Um, so my parents and family members um, are refugees from the Vietnam War. You know, we were super poor growing up. It was in Westminster, Orange County, like strip malls, really ugly. It's, you know, it's, I had bars in my window growing up. Our house, we moved seven times. Our apartment got broken into every time. Like when we got home, my mom's like, search the house, check your closet. And I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm like five years old, like doing this like hunt for like a dangerous person in the apartment. It kind of messed me up, right? Explains a little bit of all this for people who know me here. Explains a lot. <laughs> okay, so um, it was tough, you know, like, my mom worked three jobs. I had an abusive alcoholic father. We got away. Um, and it was tough. Like, my, um, my mom pretty much, well, my half, my half sister, smaller sister, she pretty much raised me growing up. And um, it was, yeah, it was tough. And we were just different, right? Like, in the 80s, you're Vietnamese. You're not like white American people. I wasn't accepted. Like, I'd bring these like lunch, delicious lunches to school that my mom made. But other kids were like, what's that smell? Gross. And I'm like, oh, yeah, now Vietnamese food is, like, really trendy, and you all want some of this. Okay. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, like, everywhere now. So you're welcome. I suffered. I paved that path. Now you have your good food. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Okay. So growing up, you know, I, had, I was a little, I was a little weird. We're going to get there. So you will die, mom. Okay. I have a lot of stories that end with you will die said by my mom. My earliest memory was of You Will Die is um, I'm getting, I was supposed to be picked up from um, kindergarten by my babysitter. And I'm with this girl who I really, I don't, I wish I remember her name because I would be like, that's my enemy forever. Okay, tattooed on my neck. I don't, neck tattoos are awesome. Don't get them. Okay, um, so, my, so we're waiting for this babysitter and she never came. And um, this girl's like, come on, I know where they live. Let's cross the street and go. But I'm like looking around, there are no cars in sight. But I'm like freaking the fuck out because in my head I hear my mom's voice. If you cross the street without me, if you cross the street by yourself, you will get hit by a car and you will die. Like, so I had like, you know, I had like my foot out and I was like, oh no, oh my God. And then I crumple into a ball and I'm freaking out. And this girl's like, what's wrong with this chick, right? Like, and you smell. Okay. So <laughs> jump to high school. I'm like 16. First job at Conroy's Flowers. I don't know if you guys remember that, but Conroy's Flowers. I like lasted a week and a half there. Um, it's just, yeah, I'm not good with like that stuff. Okay. So my mom's like, okay, um, if you take this job, okay, so, oh, we jumped to Laguna Niguel. We're in a really safe, like, really, 
weird, bougie place now, total contrast. Um, and my mom's like, if you work this job, uh, when you walk home, it's a five minute walk to my house. She's like, you have to carry the screwdriver. She gives me a screwdriver. She's like, you need to carry this screwdriver and you need to walk and let people see the thing. So <laughs> she shows up my, my first day. She drives, she's watching me. I'm like, oh my God, like life is already hard enough as it is, right? So I'm like walking and she's just driving five miles per hour. Just like, hold that screwdriver out, hold that screwdriver out. It was really hard to explain to friends, like, you know, my upbringing, right? It's like, she's like, bad people come to good places and you will die. So, okay, so that's my, you will die many, there's so many more, but we're gonna move on, okay. Um, so this, oh, this is my mom. See, she looks so sweet and gentle, right? Now. Okay. <laughs> Um, so that kind of parenting, like, really, it created a lot of anxiety in me. Like, I didn't trust my reality. I saw no cars that day, yet I crumpled. Like, I could not believe what I saw because I was told from my mother, like you were saying, Indy, like, your relationship to your parents really shape you. And, like, it, it messed me up. Okay. So um, as I got older, though, I started to understand my mom more. And uh, she would tell me stories as a child, like, when she was walking to school in Vietnam, she was actually dodging fucking bullets, like bullets, okay? So that shit was crazy. And, um, you know, my uncle was a prisoner of war for 10 years. They grew up in war. Shit was crazy. She had to survive. So that shaped her mentality. Um, so she developed a lot of PTSD from this. And uh, that left unprocessed. It became this free-floating anxiety that transferred to me. So this concept is called transgenerational trauma. If anyone's ever read Mouse, Jews and Asians, we're like this. There was a reason, you know, war and everything. Okay, but it's like, it's a real thing. So, um, okay, so getting to Paris by night. All right, so for my family and many refugees out there, oh, sorry, every day, life was a struggle. Um, but there were moments of relief. Um, so I remember there were nights where my stepdad would pop in this VHS uh, that he got from like friends or coworkers and family, and it was Paris by night. And if you guys don't know what this is, it's like this tacky, glamorous, weird kind of thing. But it was our relief. It was our relief from our everyday like struggles. So this is our Vietnamese Madonna. <laughs> or, oh yeah, her name is Linda Cheng Dai. And my sister had posters of her like everywhere in the room. Um, she was amazing. Like, this is, like, this was our Hollywood. So, yeah, Paris by Night, it was, um, like, our MTV for Vietnamese people. And, like, Tacky Glam, all that stuff, traditional music acts. And it seriously was, like, escape for my parents after a long day of working. Um, it was a shared cultural connection for them and their Vietnamese friends and family. It's something they could talk about. And it was a way to connect back to home, Vietnam especially being in a country where they knew nothing and they were treated like shit, you know, like we're other, like I won't get into all the racial like stuff we've gone into, but you know. So this was like an in-group cultural touchstone. So for Anxie's third issue uh, on boundaries, Jessica Chow uh, approached me with a current Paris, uh, current day Paris by night story. And I could not resist. I was like, I couldn't process at the time, like trying to tell the team, like, no, no, there's a story here, there's a story here. They're like, what's the story? Because I didn't actually really, like totally know, but then I just bullshitted. Thank you guys for running this. Um, but yeah, so I want to introduce uh, Jessica Chow. I invite her to the stage to talk more about um, her piece. Hi. Can, is it on? Yeah. Okay. Wait, can you guys hear us? Cool. Can you hear her? Hi. <laughs> All right, cool. We're good. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're good. Okay, so basically, there was this one night I was having dinner with my friends, and um, my friend, she was talking to me about going to Vietnam and how she was going to see her brother perform, like he was going to be this um, hosting some show and performing something, and how he's like this Justin Timberlake of of like Vietnamese music. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, how did that even happen? And then he was like, well, and she was telling me like, well, it's basically that like he was performing, you know, he got famous by Paris by Night. And I was like, you know, Paris by Night, you mean like the show that that's on the no salons, like, and, and like all the places that we're going to, and it's like in Orange County, right? That's what you're talking about. And, and then she was like, yeah. And I was like, okay, well, 
that and that just sort of intrigued me because as somebody who grew up in like you know immigrant community like the way I listened to music back in the day like I would listen to k-pop music after in the, during recess and so what I understood about music from like another language was the star was going to be coming from another country and then they're going to come over here and so this was something that was very unusual and different to me and so anyhow um, that whole that whole, so what I was wanted to know was, uh, what is Paris by Night? What is this place? And so what it actually is, is that it actually started, when I investigated, it's, it started actually at the end of World War, um, the Vietnam War. And it was something that started by the refugees who had gone to, um, you know, who had to flee the country and were in Vietnam, in, in Paris. And they um, basically gathered to kind of like, you know, create these programs and these things that would feel good about um, and singing a lot of the traditional songs and folk songs that were, um, you know, reminiscent of like these nostalgia, like pre-war and wartime music. And like when you were in these programs, like the biggest music that you could sing that was going to be, you know, like the big hitters were going to be these like really traditional ballroom music. That's like, you know, what we would consider as maybe like American country songs, kind of the similar effects. And so you see a lot of these um, and so you have like these like images that kind of like kind of have a bit of this like big band Tropicana feel and them. you still get a little bit of nostalgia but you still get the glitz and the glam and this whole production. And so as you know the time went by um, as they were producing this it's just caught get, getting better and better getting more popular and they started doing these filming um, products and then um, shows and you know with and over time, they ended up moving it over to Orange County when there was this huge population of immigrants, um, Vietnamese immigrants in Orange County. And it just became this like really big thing. And people like would go into these shows like completely decked out, um, like in just showing up in their bus. And so it's like, you know, you don't have a lot, you know, you don't, but when you go to these shows, you're definitely going to like be in a state of mind. These shows are there to transport you into the state of mind of, to this place that where you can dream and become something. And so, um, and for singers and for artists, this was really a stage where it's like, what they understood of Paris by Night is that this is a place where your dreams were gonna take off. Like there's no other place other than for the stage to be here to make your mark and really make it or break it. So when, when you get into the stage, you know that that's, you're on the right track. But, so while this became like hugely popular in the 80s and the early 90s, um, this show in communist Vietnam is banned politically because of the content that's in there, because of the fact that it's singing traditional music, traditional folk songs that are, you know, because of the content in it, it's just, you can't sing it, you can't talk about these lyrics. And a lot of the music is basically, um, they're gonna be they're gonna be forgotten over that, but because of Paris by Night's like um, influence and somehow it's just made its way over back to Vietnam, you get a lot of people were getting their hands on these copies and listening to this music and getting these bootleg copies in Vietnam, and then so then you start getting a lot of people in Vietnam who are knowing about this and sent, and wanting to make their mark, and so we have. Um, so I was able to interview um, to, like some of the top headliners um, for this story, and so this is Mai. She's basically, uh, you know, kind of like this. What she what she understands of herself is like this. She has a calling to preserve the specific type of ballroom music, um, this country music that's sung in the, her region in a very specific way, and what what her story is very interesting is because basically she's from this rural village where there's no running water, no electricity, really, really poor. And it was just this one day where she was um, singing at a coffee shop to make some extra money. And the um, founder of Paris by Night actually heard her and thought, you know, I have to get her over to Paris by Night stage because um, she's singing a song. Like she was, you know, obviously this, the way she's singing and the stuff that she's singing is banned. But if this does not get preserved, we're going to forget this. And so they... Um, got her over, and when she came over here, she became this huge sensation, um, and is like basically the person who's going to be headlining every show that they have. And you know, and now it's like her role is to be like preserving this type of singing and teaching and passing it on. Um, yeah. 
and then for Dan, and so we have another person who's also from Vietnam who like basically knew the show. He's a, he's a bit younger, um, but he you know knew the, what Paris by Night was, and he like just knew from like when the first time he saw it that that was a stage that was gonna make his dreams come true. Like he saw this show and he was like gonna have to come to the U.S. and get on the stage, and that's what he did. And 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 because from the stage, because of this, what he saw was that if he got on the stage, he would get the money, the fame, and the respect to get the life that he really wanted and deserved. You, you told me he was like he's like the Drake of yes. Vietnam. Yes, basically. So he has this. So basically, he, the first day of him like getting onto the stage, he did this like like modern modern take on this also traditional ballroom music, like. And it just like it was very controversial, but also because he's a very good looking guy with this yearning voice and everything, he's like Asian men on the rise. <laughs> he's very sexy. Asian men on the rise. Yeah. And so the way I, a lot of the stuff like what I the way I photographed it was try to mimic what was going on, like the colors that they were using on the stage and to kind of mimic that in the portraiture. Um, but in so we have all of this and we know that this but where this is all taking place is place in is in Westminster. California, and that's Orange County in the land of tract homes and strip malls and you know suburbia working class. So what I love about this photo is that when I was editing this piece, I was like, "Holy shit, this looks familiar!" So I sent a, I texted my sister, my half sister, and she's like, "Oh yeah, that's my dad's old shop." I'm like, "What?" So <laughs> my half sister, her dad's gay, arranged marriage, um, and. I grew up going to this shop and I was like, like, what's going on here? And my sister's like, oh yeah, um, he's like best friends with the owner. And it was just really weird. And he was in the tabloids all the time. My mom's like, don't ever tell anyone our names because the dude was in tabloids. And I would go to these parties where people drink Zima in the 80s. I actually hung out with some of these people, but I had no idea because I was really young. Yeah, they're like huge celebrities. Like, and yeah. And so, like, this is also just like in the you find this in the strip mall where it's like you know you have those big glitz and glam, but then really, what you know, to get your hands on it, you're going to be at these dollar stores like grabbing bootleg copies of this to really kind of get this into your home and to really be able to live that experience. And you know, these are some back copies of like there's, I mean, it's just like it goes from like you know in the beginning they're singing a lot of these like pre-war like era, and then it gets really like high highly slick. Productions of like, I don't know. But I got the pointer going. <laughs> look, look at this. It's okay. So it's like over the top. Like the way like Jessica shot gun. this was like so beautiful. But like, if you actually watch the show, you're like, what is happening right now? <laughs> right. And and so it's like, and then you know, and these are like mo places that's just like this is like an insurance shop. And then, but you see like the yeah. these little bits of decoration that kind of just shows like how we love Elvis. <laughs> I, yeah, I actually said we have a Vietnamese Elvis. Like the guy died, and then we're like, let's revive him Vietnamese style. It's, it's weird. Did it make any sense? So we're going to have some slight pizzazz in an insurance office, but um, and so I think what Paris by Night actually like really kind of represents in this story about boundaries. It's like that it was really this like cultural tether that allowed for the communities to really kind of like bounce back and forth and really co keep in touch with each other after a very, very bitter war. And like the narratives of, it really also was able to transcend the narratives of, um, you know, the, that was left by it by being like a political, like a sympathizer or a traitor. And that the acceptance of the music in both communities in abroad, I mean here and also in, the, in Vietnam, also shows how the story is now evolving, the, how the boundaries are evolving as well. Um, so what I love about uh, Jessica's piece is that, you know, if you actually know the show, it's like, it can be really out there. Like, if, as a Vietnamese person, I would see other teenagers who are Vietnamese were like, oh my God, Paris by night. It was like an inside kind of joke. But the way that, sh that you shot this was so wonderful because it really showed the respect and reverence of what these fans see, right? It's like anyone else could have shot this in a very exploitative way. But like your background, having friends who are Vietnamese, like you understood it and you grew up in this area. So I, I just thought it was so, so well done and so respectful. Um, so thank you. So next up, we have our editor-in-chief, Bobby Johnson, who is going to talk about 
some of our editorial strategy. And after, we're going to have a Q&A. So if you've got deep burning questions, or actually, if you don't, start thinking of your deep burning questions. Um, and here's Bobby. Hey. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, I'm, brace yourself. I've got a deep and hard personal story to take you all through. Um, no, I'm bullshitting you, don't worry. Um, I'm English. I don't share stuff like that. I just, I just uh, help run a magazine that gets other people to share it so that I don't have to. Um, so um, I just I, I want to talk to you very quickly about the how of Anxi stories. So, you know, I'm not a designer. It's lovely to work with great designers. Um, and I'm not a geek. I'm kind of a geek. But I'm, I'm, I'm more of a uh, words geek, a story geek. Um, but really, you know, Anxi has, has been a really important thing for me and I, I think for all of us and for everyone who reads it in kind of unlocking a whole set of things that we've talked about tonight. But it doesn't happen by accident. Indie publishing is great, right? Um, except the trouble with indie magazines is that they're usually complete shit. Uh, they're usually good at one thing, right? They, usually, they look beautiful, or they have great stories in them, or they've got a great concept, and they don't kind of hang together. You know, I love my friends who make zines, who make magazines, who do other stuff. But often, you know, you're just you're doing what you get, get something made, and you don't have the time, the space, and the luxury to kind of really dig in. I think that's where we've... We've created a team, we've tried really hard, and if you're building a team, think about it this way. You need to deliver on every aspect of what you do, and that's when people really connect with it. So, at the heart of what we do at Anxi is the personal story, right? You've heard a few tonight. Um, you, you might hear a couple more before the end. Um, but um, uh, we try and get people to tell personal stories. So, in issue one, we had uh, Kate Spear Fisher with a great um, essay about how she was in, uh, in an institution and had shock therapy and medication and was kind of totally out of it for years of her life and, and came through the other, the other side of it. In issue two, we had um, Kubra Gamuchai um, from Berlin who was talking about what it's like to have a child when uh, Europe is right, Islamophobia is rising up in Europe and you're facing, you know, you're facing a rising tide of right-wing hate you know, just for being who you are. Um, and then in issue three, we've got a great piece that's by Dana Evans about how she blamed her mother for many things that she didn't like about her life. And only later did she discover that actually her mother was a victim of trauma and abuse as a child. And that was why it was happening. But she didn't share it with anyone. And so the generational trauma was handed off from one person to another. It was only when they were on a weird party weekend that they discovered the truth. Um, but the crucial thing is we don't just... Um, talk to people about sharing their experience. We want something extra. And this is where I think we, add, we try really hard to add the extra layer. So it's not just this happened to me. It's something happened to me and I'm looking at it. I'm examining it. I'm trying to gain some insight from it. And then we're not just asking you to look at that experience and you know, gawk at it. We're asking you to really empathize with the person and go on some of that journey they've been on. They don't always resolve. You know, this uh, from issue two, Amanda Rosenberg talks about uh, dealing, you know, she was diagnosed with hypermania and, you know, hey, wow, that explains why I'm really productive sometimes and, you know, not so productive other times. But her insight is that she thought it was a superpower that she had and then she realized it's not. Like, you know, she's shit a lot of the time. And when she thinks she's, the problem with hypermania, she thought she was being great when she wasn't because she was just, she was in a manic episode. You know, and, but the insight there allows her to deal with it and process it. It's not going to go away. She's, she's, that's her life. But, but she's seeing something more, and hopefully other people can see it too. So, you know, how do we come up with this shit? Um, we have a team. Oh, look, who's that handsome chap up there? Uh, um, and, uh, you know, you've, you've met some of them tonight. There was Maddie. This is Katie. They're all lovely people. Um, but... We, what we do is we spend a lot of time, you know, we come up with a theme like workaholism. Uh, it's not an accident that workaholism was our second issue, by the way, because we all put in a lot of hours on this. But <laughs> we come up with a theme and then we try and understand, we turn it around in our hands, we look at it like an object. How can we see it from as many different perspectives as, as possible? And, you know, we also realize we don't know those perspectives, you know? So 
we are a, a great diverse team of a white guy and uh, you know some some white ladies uh, and Michelle, Indy. You know, we all many many different facets of life are represented, but. Uh, we don't know. We don't know everything. Um, and so part of the whole reason we do Kickstarter, the whole reason we do events like this, the whole reason we go out there and try and talk to people is our community is really important because they, they come up with the best ideas, um, apart from the ones I come up with. Um, <laughs> so what we do, each issue, we have a call for submissions. So we put it out there. We say, this is the theme. We want to hear what you want. What is the story you want to pitch to us? What is an idea? What's a poem? What's a, uh, a piece of art that you want to pitch to us that fits this theme? And that's where some of the really unexpected stuff comes from. Um, we put a call out for the last issue, the one that you can all buy for $25 in the, uh, in the other side after we're finished talking. Um, you can also buy the other two issues as well. Don't, don't be shy. Um, we put a call out for less than a week because we kind of fucked up our timelines and had to rush. Uh, we got 193 submissions in a week. Uh, that was uh, quite overwhelming, frankly. Uh, also great. 193 submissions, that's good. Um, so what we, we, how did we sort it? We sort of went through it and we were looking for perspective, new perspectives, different perspectives. Sometimes we have great stories that are too similar. You know, We want to look at this from different angles. We've got great stories, but they, they don't connect together or they, they overlap too much. Um, we want insight. We want that moment where somebody goes beyond just saying, uh, you know, something terrible happened to me. Look at me. Um, come with me on a journey. We want execution. We want somebody who shows the ability to actually deliver on the idea because usually it's a pitch or a kind of an explanation of something. We want to work with people who can actually deliver because often, you know, you think you want to talk about something traumatic or something difficult. When it gets down to it, it's really hard. Um, so we want someone we can get over the line with that. But we, we also know the things we don't need. We, we don't need self-help. We don't want people who are telling you how to do something. You know, This is how I got through it. We also don't want prescription. It's kind of the other side of self-help. We don't want people who are telling you how not to do something. You know, I, I did it this way. Don't do it that way. Um, that seems kind of not the point. You know, the point is for you to find your own path through. And we don't want something that's expected. You know, we, want, we want to tell a story that keeps you interested because it's probably hard um, or sometimes hard. We want you to be surprised, surprised how it turns out, surprised at how someone dealt with it, surprised how they talk about it. Um, so a couple of examples of submissions. Um, Adalis Garcia in issue three um, on a story about how growing up in her Latin family, boundaries, what, what boundaries, you know? <laughs> Is there even a Spanish word for boundaries? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, but, you know, her family all up in each other's faces all the time. Um, but that's, you know, that, that led to things that she's now dealing with. Um, we had a piece from Marylise Vigneault. Uh, it was an art project, a photography project, where she's talking about the restrictions in Pakistani law about freedom of speech and religion that create all of these kind of boundaries and barriers to people expressing their true identity. It's very hard to be a gay artist. It's very hard to protest. It's very hard to say things. It's very hard to have a religious identity that isn't kind of state-sponsored. So we take all that stuff. We work really hard. Oh, look at us, workaholism. Yeah, it's, uh, it's manifesting everywhere. And then we come up with a magazine. Um, well, I say that. Then we go and find out all of the things that aren't reflected in the submissions. So we get all those submissions in. Those are like 30 or 40% of the pieces of the puzzle. And then we're stuck with our own shitty ideas, um, trying to deal with them and trying to work, work through them and say, okay, we also know that we want to hear from these kind of people or this kind of issue or that kind of approach or something that we can talk about. So then we go back and we all sit around and we try and work out some stories that we can go and find. Um, that's really the job of an editor, is to do that. Um, it's, not, it's not correcting your spelling, it's helping you tell a story. Um, and so I'm speeding through, but I wanna show you a couple of stories that we went out and found. And if you put that dedication into going out and finding them, you can, you can do some amazing things. So the first one is, um, we knew we wanted a story. I, I'm obsessed, um, like some other people on the team with refugees. You know, I, I am not a refugee, although sometimes living in America makes you feel that way anyway, I think. But I'm, uh, you know, I'm, 
I've spent a lot of time working with, talking to refugees, trying to understand the experiences that you go through when you're dislocated like that. And we knew we, we wanted to tell a story about refugees, not just from the dealing with trauma after it's happened, but also when it's happening. So um, I'd been lucky enough to work with a writer called Eric Reedy, who's in Beirut, and um, he spent a lot of time out in the refugee camps in Lebanon uh, and elsewhere, talking to refugees all over the Middle East. Um, he went um, with a photographer we assigned, Diego Ibarra Sanchez, um, and they went out and spoke to a lot of folks who are in the refugee camps from the Syrian war, have gone over the border into, um, into Lebanon. These are huge camps. Uh, some of them are essentially permanent. You know, they've been around since the 50s um, and have, you know, up to 50 50 plus thousand people living in them forever, pretty much. Um, they can't go back to Syria. They're dealing with the trauma. They're dealing with the mental health issues. Um, also, though, they're trying to help each other deal with the mental health issues. So we talk to, you know, we talk to the people who are suffering. We also talk to the people who are deliver, trying to deliver mental health um, help in these situations. We also talk to the refugees who are trying to deliver mental health help to the refugees. So dealing with their own trauma and trying to help other people deal with trauma. That's fucking hard. Um, and then, um, so Eric's piece, I think, you know, pick it up, read it. You'll understand a lot more about how hard it is to, to cope with something like this. And then there was a piece that um, we also knew we wanted to find out more, you know, hey, hello, America. We wanted to find out what was going on here as well. Um, and we wanted to find what it's really like, you know, what does it feel like, what are the challenges, what's the, both the physical, the mental challenges of being detained by ICE. Um, this was before the family separation policy became big, big news, this, you know, we just knew that this was an area we wanted to explore. And so we went out and we talked to, I talked to a lot of people about how, you know, how can we find a story that, that um, somebody wants to share, that goes in angsty, that doesn't endanger them, that doesn't cause a problem. And um, I was lucky enough to get introduced um, to uh, a legal group called Pangea, who do lots of great work, um, and uh, met someone called Floricel, who um, had just come out of 11 months in detention uh, with ICE. She's, uh, she was an undocumented immigrant, had lived it pretty much her whole life, or uh, at least her adult life. Um, had three kids who were all citizens. And then one day she was scooped up by ICE after having breakfast at IHOP with her kids out in the street, just picked up fucking horrible shit, right? Um, it makes me, I'm just angry thinking about it. Um, you know, and, but they refused her bond. She couldn't, they wouldn't let her back out, even though she clearly had ties, they weren't going to run, you know, none of that stuff. Um, she hadn't committed a felony, none of, you know, we can go into the legal details, but... But Floricel uh, spent 11 months being very mistreated by uh, the US government, um, pretty much because she's brown, um, you know, and she happens to have decided to flee, you know, uh, the pain back home that she was enduring to try and uh, to find a better life. Um, and as someone who's lucky enough to have, you know, been given paperwork, I, you know, this just hits home and, you know, the, the team we're, this is the kind of stuff we care about. Um, and so, um, uh, interpreter, Andrea, and I drove out to go and meet Floricel. We spent a, a day with her, hearing about her story, trying to help us um, get through it. She only speaks Spanish, really, so, um, so we had to do a lot of talking. Um, and it was really, I've been an editor and a reporter for 20 years, you know, and it was one of the most moving experiences I've ever had, you know, sitting, hearing, um, hearing Floricel talk, hearing her share her story and try and, try and get it out. Um, you know, and there were lots of tears, uh, not from me because I'm, you know, English, like I said, but, um, but I, I, had, I, I had to basically take a few days off afterwards just from hearing it, you know, it's tough. Therapists, give your therapist a, uh, maybe not a hug the next time you see them, but they deserve, they deserve some help. It's hard, it's hard to, to be there. But, you know, Floricel is now part of an ACL suit against ICE for the way she was treated. Um, and in fact, um, and I think this is one of the stories I'm proudest of in this issue because it's, it's the right moment, it's the right time, it's the right story, and there's a great person who wants to share it. And actually, Floricel should be here somewhere in the audience. I wanted to just invite her out to say hi. Floricel, are you in here? Yeah, hi.
So we're, we're lucky enough that a, a bunch of different contributors are here uh, tonight, but I think Floricel um, wanted to share a few words with us. Um, you, did you prepare some remarks? I'm going to... There's that. Um, and maybe, Indy, if you want to come up and translate on the spot, that would be great. Hola, Floricel, ¿cómo está? Hola. Muy buenas noches a todos. Uh, gracias por estar aquí, por venir a cada uno de ustedes. Uh, good night. Um, good night, everyone. Thank you for being here and for, you know, coming to this event. Yeah. Quiero darle las gracias a Bobby, a todo su equipo. I want to thank Bobby and the whole team. Por hacer uh, expandir a uh, mi caso, mi situación por medio de la revista. For sharing my story through the magazine. Como había comentado él, Eh, estuve 11 meses en una detención de inmigración. Uh, like he shared, I was 11 months in a detention center. Un proceso muy largo y muy triste. A uh, very long and sad process. Tengo tres niños menores de edad. I have three children all under age. Ah, uh, pero gracias a Dios estoy, gracias a Dios a la organización, a organización Pangea, que me ayudó a, a, a salir libre. And Thank God and thank the organization Pangea that helped me, you know, um, get free. Todo ahorita con inmigración es un proceso muy triste para nosotros los inmigrantes. Uh, right now, the, um, the process of immigration has been really difficult and tough for, for us who are immigrants. Y estoy aquí para poner un stop al miedo que siento y alzar mi voz. And I want to be here just to... Um, sort of raise my voice and be uh, sort of like a testament to the story. Uh, fue un proceso muy largo y eh, todo está, um, las reglas de inmigración son muy tristes. Eh, yo estuve de detención en detención, estuve en la detención de Arruismo, uh, contra Costa, una detención muy difícil. Mm -hmm. She was saying that she was taken from detention to detention to many different places, Contra Costa and other detentions, in a, in a very difficult situation. Estoy aquí también para alzar la voz por las personas que están allá adentro. I, want, I also want to raise my voice for the people who are still in detention. Es una detención que, que este, um, tiene el proceso muy difícil allá adentro con las personas que están detenidas. And, and the process in there is very difficult. Floricel, si no pudiese decir, cuando dice difícil, ¿tiene algún modo de uno o dos ejemplos para que yo entienda lo que quiere decir difícil? Okay. Es una situación um, que los, las reglas son muy estrictas. Okay. So I'm asking Floricel to expand on what she means by difficult, because I think she's trying to say more than, than just difficult. And, and what she finds that it was more challenging was the fact that um, the, the, the rules are so strict. Um, there seems to be very constrained in what you can or cannot do. Oí que hay nuevas reglas en el proceso de las situaciones que están pasando los inmigrantes ahí, que unos van a ser trasladados a otros estados. Mm -hmm. uh, este, que están ahí esperando una, una decisión por medio de, una, de un juez. Y es triste todo eso porque uh, eh, lo van a tener que mover a otro estado, eh, separar más, más lejos de los familiares. So she's, she's worried that the people who are still in detention are being moved to different states where they're going to be more farther and farther away from their families into states that they've never been before. So she's concerned that, you know, even with the rules that are changing now and what we're reading in the news, it's really, you know, not, not looking like a positive um, experience for everyone who's, you know, in this situation. Yo tuve tres meses en esa detención y este, uh, mis hijos no me podían visitar frecuentemente por situaciones económicas. Y uh, me pongo en mi situación, si yo estuviera ahí y me trasladaran a otro lugar, prácticamente perdería las esperanzas yo de, de seguir peleando mi yeah. caso. So she's saying that when she was in a detention center, she couldn't really see her children for about three months, mainly because um, of economic reasons. But if she would have been moved to a different state, the chances of being seeing her children would have been even more difficult. Um, la distancia sería más lejos. Mm -hmm. Las ganas de luchar se me agotarían. 
and, and she's worried that in her experience, she would feel if that had happened to her um, with the longer distance, she would lose hope that anything was, was possible for changing in her situation. Migración tiene el poder para dejar, eh, para poner a todas esas personas, ponerlas en libertad. Y quiero que, que hagamos y que pongamos un poquito nosotros um, un, un granito de arena para apoyar, para donar para eso, todas esas personas que están ahí y puedan alcanzar fianza, puedan ser libres. So she, she's really here to, you know, ask us to, you know, give our little, I don't say, say granito de arena, a little support so that we can help people who are in these situations um, get out of these situations, that immigration really does have the power to make these decisions of how things are handled. Um, and that if you find yourself in a place where you, know, you can donate or help or be involved in some way, that that's what she's really here for, um, to sort of, you know, again, be a testimony to the story. Yo pongo mis, mi caso como ejemplo, que yo pude salir, ahorita estoy reunido con mis hijos, y tanta gente que están ahí detenidas, con ese granito de arena que nosotros podamos poner, puede salir toda la gente en vez de ser trasladada a otro estado. Claro. So she's, she's, she's saying that um, you know, her story is an example of, of what's possible when you do get the help that you need. Um, and that she, you know, she's really here to sort of, again, you know, be a testimony for what's possible when you know, we participate in the process and you know, donate and you know, um, get involved. Gracias por lo Para mí es un placer que usted esté aquí. Yo le estaba diciendo a Bobby que quería hacer esa historia y que si podía encontrar una persona y, y qué, qué bueno que, que está aquí con nosotros. De verdad que lo aprecio. Le doy gracias a Dios eh, en primer lugar y a todas las personas que me estuvieron apoyando por medio de la página de Facebook, siguiendo la, la, por medio de, de la organización Pangea. Ah, y gracias a todas esas personas yo estoy libre. Estoy este, conviviendo y disfrutando a mis hijos. Ellos um, han pasado por una situación tan difícil claro. y un, largo, un proceso muy largo. Claro. Ella dice, um, sorry, <laughs> she's saying that uh, she feels really grateful because uh, Floricera has a p Facebook page and a community together with uh, Panacea who has helped her really get out of the situation and that right now she's in a much better place where she's enjoying her children and she is, is really, you know, kind of, feeling blessed that all of this was able to work out. Um, and, you know, just to give you a little bit of context, um, we were talking, um, we talked to Floricel, and um, we saw everything that was happening. I, I mean, I couldn't believe it when I saw the news. Um, and and we, know, we knew we had this story. Um, and then um, because of the testimony that Floricel gave to Bobby together with the lawyer, the ACLU was able to actually put in this lawsuit. And then the Guardian reported the story. And then we sent our story to the Guardian. And now you can read both about the lawsuit, but you also can read about Floricel's experience. And that experience, everyone, can, everyone around the world can read. And, and I think it's a testimony to you know, what we can do when we invest ourselves in, in things we do, care deeply about. Can we give a round of applause for Floricel? Muchas gracias, Bobby. Muchas gracias a todo el equipo. Gracias. Thank you, Floricel. The, um, so I, I just in case, you know, I don't care which way you vote. Um, well, I kind of care, but I, I, you know, the, 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 one of the points here is we're, we have the agency and the power. You've heard about what trauma can do to kids, what trauma can do to families, what experiences live on, not just in you, but in the people you interact with, everything. And to choose to enact that upon other people seems like the worst kind of behavior that is possible. You know, we're creating a whole new generation of angsty readers, for sure. But uh, I don't, I'd rather not do that, if possible. So, um, so I'm really pleased that we could share that story. Um, I know we're, we're probably way, way, way past time. So just give us a negative number, Michelle. How, how far past are we? Um, a lot, okay. Um, so, um, so that's one of the, you know, one of the important things we can do, and you know, and don't just read the story, go and do something about it. Um, but I also just wanted to finish, you know, it's not just 
stuff like that that we, you know, there is lots of hard stuff. There is lots of dark stuff. There is lots of dealing with shit in Anxi, but there's also weird, funny stuff. Um, you know, there's a whole spectrum of experience out there. So I just wanted to give one more shout out to um, Francesca, Francesca, uh, who was on the, is, are you here? Yeah, hey, so this, um, so in our, we called out to readers, hey, readers, we love you. Can you draw your boundaries? Give us an idea of how you sense your boundaries. We got some responses. Francesca went and did something way better than we could have thought of, you know, is what I'm saying. Um, she went and Amazon Turk that shit, right? So I don't know if anyone knows Amazon Mechanical Turk. This is where we suddenly we supply the geek side of things. Phew, you didn't think we'd get there. Um, but um, instead of her drawing her boundaries, what she did is she, um, she essentially created a job, put it out there into Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is, a, which is like a crowdsourcing work engine. People from all over the world can contribute. They can complete a task. They can get paid a little bit of money, and then they, they do it. So she set up a task to, for other people to draw their boundaries, and they did. My goodness. Um, and, and, you know, suddenly we had you know, a way different uh, set of folks contributing than we did normally, which was great, you know. And we had people, people who took it very seriously and, you know, very emotionally, and then people who did not, um, or maybe their art skills weren't, you know, as exciting. Um, uh, and, you know, I tried, you know, this is a 60-year-old British male. Uh, it feels a little close, to be honest. But, um, uh, you know, people from all over the world contributing, sharing their boundaries. Um, some of them are... Ooh, that's, um, I don't know what's going on there really, but it, it doesn't look comfortable. <laughs> this one you can't see um, down in the bottom right here, but this is someone from Italy who just drew a map of Italy. <laughs> they took it very literally. These are my boundaries. Oh, fair, fair. You know, um, but, um, you know, it's, so it's not just about, you know, there's obviously processing and pe some people took it and, and went with it, but, you know, we have fun as well. You know, mental health isn't just about the darkness and that's from a design perspective we look at that from an editorial perspective we look at that we try and say look this is we're humans we're complete humans um maybe some part of us isn't you know normal but we can explore what goes on and we can sometimes we can even have a little bit of fun doing it so um so yeah so uh i mean there's it's it's so much fun um and i think this is what happens you know when you when you open i i want to finish up um oh by the way, boundaries. You may have noticed we've asked you to draw your own boundaries. So some, some people on the other side, you can join in. We're not going to pay you like Amazon Mechanical Turk does, but um, you can have food and beer. So, um, But when you open the door to creativity, suddenly you get all the things you don't expect. You get people sharing, you get people telling stories, you get people doing these amazing things, completely un, un, you know, prompted but not shaped they come in and they they tell you things they tell you stories about um, being in detention they tell you stories about dealing with stuff with their mom they tell you stories about um how they feel about their own boundaries and i think that's that's one thing i want you to take away and think about how you open the door to creativity for yourself and for other people that's me <laughs> <laughs>